Thank you for joining us for our session on AI data and well-architected. We're excited to give you an inside look at um, some of the new enhancements and expansion to the well-architected framework. But first, of course, our forward-looking statement, your reminder to make your purchasing decisions based on what's available in our products today and not on any statements that we might make during the session. And we're going to dive right in because we just have 20 minutes, but I did want to take a moment to thank you. Thank you for joining us for the session. Thank you for investing in your learning and for joining us at Dreamforce or wherever you're watching this virtually. So my name is Susanna Playstead. I am the product manager for Salesforce Well Architected, and I'm joined by some of my amazing colleagues. Hey, uh, my name is Tyson Reed. I am product manager for the Salesforce Event Bus. I work on event-driven architectures and how customers can use events to you know, orchestrate all of their business processes with their external systems. Hi, my name is Stella Han. I actually part of the Data Cloud product team. Very happy to be here and share our experiences with you. Yeah, so to get started, we are going to um, just give you a quick overview of the Salesforce Well-Architected Framework in case that's a new topic to you. But then we're going to spend most of the time hearing from my two colleagues here, giving you some examples of the types of information you can find in Well-Architected and also how we develop that guidance. And we'll send you off with some next steps as well. Okay, so Salesforce Well-Architected, in case you haven't heard of it before, is guidance and best practices on how you can design healthy solutions with Salesforce products. And this guidance, all of it can be found on architect.salesforce.com. And it wasn't just built by one team at Salesforce. Um, this is truly guidance that we've put together and um, vetted with uh, colleagues and experts from across Salesforce, so from our engineering teams, from folks in customer success and professional services, product managers like my two colleagues that are joining me today, and then also architects in the ecosystem who are working on the front lines and actually testing out these products with real world use cases. And all of the content in Well Architected is structured around three core architectural principles which are trusted, easy, and adaptable. This is a term, anti-pattern, that we talk a lot about in the well-architected well world. Um, and an anti-pattern is just what it sounds like. It's the opposite of a best practice. And it's essentially what you should not do <laughs> with Salesforce. And I share this term because that's really where we started when we looked to expand our guidance beyond just the core Salesforce platform. Um, we wanted to expand it to data cloud and of course generative AI. And we started w developing anti-patterns and the corresponding patterns. And I wanted to give you an inside look at how we actually did this. So I mentioned that we work cross teams with lots of different folks that aren't you know, geographically co-located. Um, maybe we don't work a lot across those lines. And so of course we use Slack, we use Slack lists to help develop the guidance and then really um, test it. So we had folks, I feel like Stella, you challenged some of the advice. We saw this, these pieces of guidance coming in across and Stella was like, hey, wait a second, like, does that really make sense? And then we had this great debate with yes. two experts, right, in finding the best guidance to give to you. I remember that. <laughs> it was awesome. And, and that's one of the really cool things about Well Architected, right, is that it's, it's a way to gather all of this information from different parts of Salesforce and have real opinions about what makes sense to do and what makes sense to avoid. Definitely, exactly. yeah, yeah, it's that opinionated stance yeah. too, which makes it different from like help docs or trailhead, which give you yeah. That, which are amazing resources, but we are giving you that opinionated architect's view. And after we debated and landed on the guidance that was most relevant, um, again, just sort of an inside look at how we run Well Architected at Salesforce, um, we of course use Salesforce to manage all of our guidance, um, and we use Heroku Connect to actually sync it to a Postgres database that is the engine behind the guidance that you see on architect.salesforce.com. And as you can see, we have more than 800 patterns and anti-patterns, and we're constantly adding more um, with all of the new features that are coming out as new guidance coming, comes in, we're releasing that directly to you. But enough about the inner workings of Well Architected. I wanted to make sure that you had time to hear real examples of anti-patterns. Maybe that sounds like something that might be useful, but I want Tyson and Stella to share with you both how they collaborated in coming up with this guidance and then give you like a preview of some of the types of information you can find. So with that. Absolutely, thanks so much. So uh, when we're thinking about event-driven architectures and kind of how that fits into Salesforce Well Architected, uh, we've got a couple patterns that we can call out as like, hey, here's best practices to think about. Here's signals that tell us that event-driven architectures make sense for a use case. 
And of course, we have our anti-patterns that we're trying to call out as things that we don't want to do, right? And in Well-Architected, you're going to see this advice big picture where you're talking about different patterns, and you're also going to see a different level of granularity too, where there's, there's really specific aspects of the different tools that get called out here. So it's, it's really a phenomenal resource to, to leverage. Um, just kind of to pull things back, for, for those of you that aren't familiar with event-driven architectures, they're a great way to handle high-scale use cases. So that's always a signal that I listen for when I'm, I'm working with internal teams at Salesforce and when I'm working with customers. When they've got you know, big, spiky bursts of traffic that are generating a ton of transactions, that's often a good sign that means, hey, events might have a role to play in handling that bursty traffic. Um, and you know, when we're thinking about situations where events don't necessarily make sense, is when you don't necessarily need to take advantage of all the features of asynchronous processing, mm -hmm. of, of kind of decoupling all the different pieces that represent an event-driven architecture. Those trade-offs, right? Exactly, there's mm -hmm. trade-offs. Sometimes, hey, the scale doesn't lend itself, and you might as well keep it simple, keep it synchronous, mm -hmm. you know, s stick with some of the, the more traditional point and response patterns for integration. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's really a, a super high-level kind of intro to event-driven architectures. And to kind of dive in a little bit more deeper into a story of how we've used uh, event-driven architectures and, and use these best practices that are represented in the well-architected framework, let me tell you a little bit about what we've been doing with CRM and AI. So uh, I'm sure that a lot of you have been hearing a lot about retrieval augmented generation about RAG with LLMs. If you haven't, uh, basically what you want to do is you want to give your LLM away to reference data that's changing in real time, right? Because you're training your LLM on a, on a particular data set, and it's not necessarily aware of what data has changed since the time it was trained. So you're able to augment the responses that the LLM gives you with that, that RAG database. And one of the great ways to keep your RAG store up to date is with an event-driven architecture, right? So as changes are happening in your Salesforce org, those changes are able to be ingested and made available to your LLMs. And this is actually how we've been building Data Cloud and, and Agent Force at Salesforce, right? Like, we're using these event-driven architectures to get this information uh, in, into, to, into those data stores. So we're using this pattern in our tools Ab and sort of testing it. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and Stella is actually going to dive into this uh, in a couple Capability. slides where we talk about all the different ways that Data Cloud is able to ingest this information. That's right. um, so that's, that's, that's one way to think about how you can use uh, event-driven architectures and, and that sort of pattern to drive uh, AI uh, use cases. And then when we're thinking about how does this apply to data cloud more generally, uh, another great example of using a well-architected pattern is using um, events as a way to surface changes from data cloud back into Salesforce, right? So we see this with data actions in data cloud, where data cloud is using a platform event and essentially a webhook to send those events back into Salesforce or wherever they need to go. So it's a great way to, to really be able to leverage the tremendous power of data cloud to really respond to these uh, you know, situations where you have a lot of data changing and you have a lot of things that need to react to those data changes. So um, I think that it's been really tremendous to kind of see this, this pattern get leveraged again and again within Salesforce to build these high, high profile products that we have today. That's awesome. That's awesome. So let me turn it over to Stella to dive in a little bit more deeper into data cloud. Yeah, thank you, Tyson. So I just a brief intro about my role. Um, part of data cloud product management team I have a special responsibility is really kind of uh, taking on working with our top 10 data cloud customers. I really wanted to make sure that we give them guidance from the overall solution architecture perspective and best practice. Because uh, you know our objective is really trying to, by working very closely with them, understand the insights, the needs, and what is our true product gap. Because we really want to make sure whatever we have developed is going to meet their needs and also meeting the generic market needs, right? Yes. So it makes sense. We wanted to bring them as our market customers. Yeah. So whatever architecture pattern that we have developed, it's going, it, it can be repeatable and it can be leveraged by all our customers, right? Makes sense. So um, we, from data cloud perspective, we have in the past five, six years, uh, launched a uh, very uh, large set of different type of uh, capabilities in a very granular level. So um, I, I can do capability based on different, uh, uh, like different themes, but uh, I wanted to start focusing on maybe using uh, an angle from end to end, our delivery latency perspective. 
right? Because initially when we launched the products, it's more started as a CDP, which is focusing on my tech use cases. Mm -hmm. But customers say, hey, I want to have the capability to ingest the data. Absolutely. Wanted to be able to unify all my data into one single profile. Mm -hmm. right? And then once it's done, then I'm able to um, you um, drag and drop building the segments and activations as such. And another key guiding principle, like Tyson, you said, right? We want to make sure this is a one metadata platform because mm -hmm. everything we do is one seamlessly metadata driven so that everything becomes simple point and click configurations, mm -hmm. right? So, so we have building this uh, batch data processing pipeline. You see here uh, a list of connectors allow our customers to bring the data easily. Uh, basic transform allow you to prepare the data before you can map into a standard data model. So end-to-end -end processing. Mm -hmm. So uh, over the time, then working with the customers, they start to raise additional requirements. They say, <laughs> "Hey, I don't like every single of my job to be batch driven. How about I'm able to train individual events, like just based on the." One finishing of the events can start another one, right? So this is where we're making sure every single step now become more API driven so that we are using our overall super powerful orchestration engine, which is our flow, to train the events together to, to deliver that. So, and another thing as part of the batch transform, what we have done is the zero copy, right? Mm -hmm. So you are able to bring external data without having to copy it, integrate, access, activate it, very powerful. So you can see just for batch transform, uh, you, we are incrementally deliver a lot of capabilities when time goes on. Now, coming to the next one. Then we start to get into use case that, hey, customers say, I wanted to have almost near real time delivery latency, right, minutes, because if I received a uh, car event, right, I wanted to understand what is the car, uh, current mileage of the car, mm -hmm. because if the customer have not scheduled a service appointment, hey, guess what, I wanted to send him an email, say, it's time to book a service appointment, mm -hmm. right? So, so as such, then we're building a pretty comprehensive streaming pipeline to allow you to bring the data into micro batch in minutes, bring some transform, and create some insight and using these powerful events and data actions to be able to push this thing either onto a journey or integrate with your downstream application system. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and then another thing we also have done, which is super powerful in my view, is that uh, we, we're making every single data model object to, pick, uh, to have a uh, uh, change data capture event enabled. What does it mean? Because everything within our platform is seamlessly connected. Now you can using those change record capture events to, um, to trigger a flow and then drive a lot of the CM, you know, downstream yeah. processes and enhance the experiences, yeah? And then, then now customers say, hey, that's great, but guess what? While my customers on the website, on the mobile, I wanted to quickly you know, making some you know, recommendations based on our understanding of them or what they are browsing and such, right? So the need is that, hey, we need to deliver real-time end-to-end latency within milliseconds. When I say mm -hmm. milliseconds, really talking about one or two seconds, something, right? Mm -hmm. So as such, now we come up with capabilities. You deploy our web SDK, mobile SDK, the events coming very fast. We even are is able to connect the unknowns to the knowns mm -hmm. and quickly building a profiling insights and then everything become accessible in a real-time data graph fashion. Mm -hmm. We actually internally working very closely with our platform team events with our personalization team. So now we are able to make in real-time offers recommendation in milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So I have two, so like two takeaways in all of this, right? That's For right. me, when I'm looking at this, so number one, you can see on this beautiful diagram that some things are GA, some things are coming soon across all three areas. So we're continue to innovate and batch and streaming in real time because you as architects may be watching this, you, you can choose, right? Which if there's so many options, it's not just you choose, you're gonna do batch for everything. You're, you need to choose for your requirements based on what is the right fit. And that's really one of the reasons why patterns and anti-patterns yeah, patterns, and what not right, to do right. becomes important because you need to be making those right trade-offs and evaluations. Yeah, right? yeah. And then, you know, just keep in mind, right, these are the different type of building blocks that you are offered, mm -hmm. right? As an architect, so, um, Think about this as a Lego box. You can pick and choose, and then then turn up based on the use case requirement, and then deliver something, putting something together to 
to enable you know the business needs. And then another thing, just like Suzanne, you mentioned, you see a lot of things here is coming up, but is data cloud is actually one of the fastest growing uh, products within Salesforce. So over the next one, two, three releases, you're gonna see so many more capabilities coming. So just uh, you know, watch our roadmap and see how things are going. Yeah, now given that. Uh, oh, another thing I wanted to mention is uh, just double click. Uh, is our zero copy technologies, right? Like I mentioned earlier, it's a very, it's really the industry defining moment. We actually invented these capabilities to ensure interoperability between different platforms. Now, you know, it just the uh, data accessing from snowflakes and such becomes so much easier. But some customers just say, hey, you know, it's great. I wanted to apply all my use cases using this pattern, but that's not true, right? You have to pick and choose. And you need to be aware, there's a list of best practices and guardrail that you need to be uh, be aware when you start uh, start your implementations. Uh, the guidance really from us is just to start small, don't try to leverage everything, and then you know gauge the performance with initially small set of records to see how it works. Eh? And also another thing is zero copy does not necessarily working towards the streaming pipeline mm -hmm. or the real time pipeline. Right? Keep that in mind. That's also another thing very important for you. Yeah. Uh, do you want to? Yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. we just gave you sort of a glimpse and a little bit of a deep dive into a couple of patterns and sort of maybe gave some illustrations of why it's so important to understand sort of these watch outs or these anti-patterns. So if you want to dive in deeper to our patterns and anti-patterns across data cloud, across generative AI, and across CRM, of course, um, the place to go is the pattern and anti-pattern explorer. It's on architect.salesforce.com. And this is where you can really filter and explore and search by keyword if you're looking for a particular, if you search batch, for example, I'm sure some great stuff for batch Apex and data cloud will come up. Um, but definitely encourage you to check out this resource. We're constantly adding to it. It was updated days before Dreamforce. And as uh, our new tools like data cloud and our AI suite evolve faster than our three releases a year, um, this pattern and anti-pattern explorer is going to continue to evolve as well. And I think with that, um, yeah, Tyson. Yeah. Couple, couple uh, call outs to look forward to. Uh, we've got some developer forest booths over in Moscone West that are great opportunities to learn more about event driven architecture. We have a booth dedicated to the Salesforce event bus where you can learn more about platform events and change data capture. And what folks are watching this online? Oh, well, they're going to they're going to be able to tune into <laughs> the developer keynote, uh, wow. which is going to be a great show. I encourage everybody that's here today to check that out, and the folks that are watching online to tune in. Um, and of course, after Dreamforce, they should be checking out the Well Architected Guide for Event Driven Architecture. We're keeping that up to date, and we're always trying to update it with new ideas of, of anti patterns and patterns for folks to be considering. Awesome. And if you missed out, if you're watching online, the Architect Keynote is also available for you to, to explore all of the great innovations with the Well Architected Framework and our other tools. And um, with that, I think thank you for joining, thank you for watching, and um, we will be seeing you all soon. Thank you. Thank you so much.